and uh, it is my pleasure to give the floor to our host, Hamdalatu. Hello, Professor Hello. My name is Hamdalatu, um, and I'm here today with me. Um, joining me is Daniel Ford and Donas Jafari. And we have the uh, privilege, we are so happy to speak live with you today as regards to our cognitive um, psychology class. And this has been made possible by our professor, um, Sam Norbert, a research assistant professor here at John Mason. Again. And we are so glad to talk to you today. So, we, we are going to start this discussion briefly. Your paper published in the journal Baika on dorsal and ventral video streams. And then we drift uh, through general open uh, discussion of science and life to your Minerva project. Okay. How does it sound? Great? Okay. So please. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll start. Okay. Hi, Professor. Um, this is uh, kind of general for the class. Um, what a real world difference would one that relies on their dorsal processing versus their ventral processing have? Okay. So can you hear me? Because you just clipped out a little bit. Can you hear me okay? Yes. We can hear you. Okay, good. All right. So everybody relies on their dorsal and ventral processing all the time. I mean, you couldn't survive for 10 minutes, um, 10 seconds probably, without it. So the issue is people who do above and beyond what they need just to function, sort of the optional component. So the way I've been thinking about this is imagine a two by two table, okay? Where across the top, we've got the extent to which you do this kind of optional use of the dorsal system. So you do it a lot uh, or you do it a little. So a lot means you devise plans, you execute them uh, in detail. The plans are, are multi-part uh, and so forth, they're highly articulated. Whereas not doing it very much still means you're using the dorsal system, say when you walk around, you don't bump into things, things like that, but it's not the kind of optional use of it. Similarly, if you go down the columns, sorry, the rows, uh, for the ventral system, you can imagine people who use it a lot optionally. They classify things, interpret things in ways they don't actually have to by the challenges of the environment. People who don't have to much. So is that, is that idea clear? You can have a little two by two table? So, because we found very, very small correlations in the scores for the dorsal and ventral. So what's interesting about this table is we can now define four what I'm calling cognitive modes and I've labeled them in cute ways to make them memorable. So take the upper left uh, um, cell where you use the dorsal system a lot to formulate detailed plans and you use the ventral system a lot to interpret what's going on. So I call this mover mode, mover mode, where you make detailed plans, you don't actually have to by being forced by the environment, and you monitor what's going on. So depending on what's happening, you can revise your plan. That's mover mode. Now go to where you're um, not using the dorsal system as much optionally, but you do use the ventral system a lot. I call that perceiver mode. So now you're not so much making detailed plans optionally, looking ahead, being proactive, but you're very good at sort of noticing what's going on around you and picking up on it. Now let's look at that cell where you're using the dorsal system a lot optionally, but um, not the ventral system. I, I call that stimulator mode, where you come up with a lot of ideas and plans, but you're not really good at adjusting them, depending on what's happening. And finally, the last cell, we are not using either system very much optionally. I call it adapter mode. That's where the environment is sort of setting the agenda for you, and you're going along with it. So that the key idea is these are modes, these are cognitive modes, and they depend on things like 
your knowledge of the situation. You have a deep knowledge, you can obviously classify, and if you have knowledge about previous strategy that worked, you can use that for setting up new strategies. So there's a big context dependency. But even so, the idea is that people have a default or a dominant mode that they're most comfortable with, that they'll kind of slip into all other things being equal. So that the modes were a mover, you're using both systems optionally, uh, perceiver, where you're using the ventral, but not the dorsal optionally. Stimulator, where you're using the dorsal a lot, but not so much the ventral. And then adapter, where you let the environment set it. So these are not related to personality particularly, in theory. They're not particularly supposed to be related to IQ. It's really preferred ways of interacting with the world and other people in certain circumstances. That was a long answer to what was helpful. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Uh, okay, so another question we have for you is that uh, we know there are multiple theories on the dorsal system properties. Uh, one, where the dorsal processes spatial and the ventral system processes object properties. Another theory by Goodall and Molnar, they say that the dorsal system uses spatial information and the ventral system is crucial for the identification of objects. What's your perspective on this? That's a, a part of it. I mean, if you look at earlier early papers like, I think, 1993 out of um, Goldman Rikisha's group at Yale, they showed that if you look at, so going back to the beginning, the, the original work was by Pohl, it was sort of ignored in the early 70s, and then Ungerleiter Mishkin picked up on that in 1982, published a really famous paper where they talked about the what system and the where system, where their idea was that the ventral system, the temporal lobes, were involved in classification um, and identifying objects, sort of the wet piece, whereas the parietal lobes were involved in spatial relations, the, the wear piece. Then what happened is Goldman Rikisha's group uh, did both the anatomy, where it turns out there's very precise connections between posterior parietal lobes and the dorsal lateral frontal lobes upper parts of the frontal lobes, sort of. And there's very precise connections between the temporal lobe and the inferior convexity, the bottom parts of the frontal lobe. So you can think of anatomically the dorsal system is extending all the way from the occipital lobe, sorry, it goes from the occipital lobe up to parietal and then the, the more superior parts of the frontal lobe. Just look at the connectivity, that, that's how it looks. Whereas the ventral system is the occipital lobe and temporal lobe, and th that projects up to the inferior part, the bottom part and medial part of the frontal lobe. So you've got these two anatomically defined systems. So they looked in monkeys, Goldmark Keisha's group, and showed that the frontal lobes were involved in memory, but memory for object identity in the ventral part and spatial relations in the dorsal part. And about a later group showed that about 50% of the neurons uh, are actually coding both, and they fall right between. So you've got in the frontal lobes an area up here, which is doing the spatial memory, the area lower is doing the object memory. This is a monkey now. And then between them, something is conjoining memories for where something is and what it is. Um, but we also know that the upper parts of the frontal lobes are critically involved in planning. That's been known for a long time. So you think about it, one of the reasons that spatial information is important for planning is a lot of planning has to do with moving around the environment. And you don't want to bump into something. And you need to know where the goal is. So if you think back to our ancestors, you need to know where the tree limb is or something. Um, so there, it's not an accident that the spatial stuff is so intimately involved with the planning stuff. And similarly, I don't think it's an accident that parallel processing is massively used in the ventral system because we want to identify things very quickly. So plans are, are serial by their nature. You're doing one thing followed by another. And the, the dorsal system is very serial in the way it's, it functions, whereas the ventral system is much more parallel. And that's tailor-made for identifying objects where you've got huge numbers of memories that you need to compare at the same time. 
Um, so, so my view is the systems are, are more broadly functional than what the early monkey stuff suggested. But what, what they had to say was correct. I think it is the case that the dorsal systems involve in things spatial, but that's subsidiary to its role in, in planning and navigation and so forth. And the ventral system is involved in recognition and identification. Did that answer your question? Yeah. More or less? Uh, may, I, uh, yeah, yeah, please, please. may I ask you a quick question? Uh, so I remember there was a lot of debate uh, between conscious and unconscious processing uh, as related to dorsal versus ventral division. And uh, I, I thought that uh, somehow it was even considered that the dorsal stream is not really involved in awareness. But when you say that it is involved in planning, that it, it seems like there is a contradiction here. Can, can you explain? Sorry. Well, I don't think there's a consciousness center in the brain. I think um, consciousness arises from processing all over the place. And that I think what you're probably referring to is Mel Goodale's work where they had a patient yeah, who yeah. Uh, apparently could use the dorsal system without being consciously able to anticipate what she was going to do. Um, I think you can blind find sight. those kind of dissociations all over the brain where people can do things like blind sight. Blind side, yes, that's what I'm talking about. Which is probably more ventral. It's the same kind of dissociation. You can recognize things without being aware of what they are. Um, from my perspective, um, the dorsal system, and particularly the prefrontal lobe, which, by the way, uh, uh, Francis Crick and, and Christoph Koch, they had the theory that, that the dorsal prefrontal is critically involved in consciousness. I mean, they wanted to try to identify with that area. I think all these attempts are, are probably not to localize conscious to one place. They're probably not as well founded as they could be. Uh, I think my own view is consciousness is probably about um, something like parity checking. <laughs> so you know, if you think about what you know, you ask the question: What would consciousness do, assuming it's functional, which it may not be? That just simple old information processing the brain wouldn't do. Well, if you have, think about parity checking, where you have a bit that's it's set, you know, yeah, hot or even, so you can check to see if there's been a corruption in, in the byte. You, you all know what I'm talking about? Well, Let's yes. Do, is it a computer science oriented class? Yeah, no, no, this is cognitive psychology class. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we are really not talking here about consciousness, but that was my excuse. I, I apologize for this. No, it's okay, but the idea is that if you, if so, in a, in a byte, in a computer's memory, you've got eight bits, and one of them is called the parity bit, you, where if you added the other ones up, assuming that they were binary numbers, you can set the parity bit so that it should always be an even number or an odd number. And the reason for that is to make sure the cosmic rays or something else didn't corrupt the information. So the question is what checks the parity bit to make sure it's set right? And you can get into an infinite regress. So my thought is that consciousness is about doing something that's harder to do with just information processing. It's something more like if you if you play a guitar, if you strum the strings, you can tell whether they're in tune or not just by whether there's beats, there's dissonance. It's an emergent property from the strings, all of them together. And consciousness may be something similar. It may be sort of an emergent property. But anyway, that I don't know that we want to go there. I got it. Thank so. you.